I was telling uh, Pierre Guido, Andrea, that uh, we have uh, around 400 registered participants. So we should have a very nice audience this morning. <clears throat> Okay. <clears throat> okay, I think uh, I stop uh, sharing the screen now. <clears throat> Voila. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, edition of the Data at Breakfast. <clears throat> um, Maybe if, uh, for those of you that uh, join us for the, for the first time, uh, Data Breakfast was uh, uh, started more than two years ago as a real breakfast with, with a talk, as a monthly event. But since the, the lockdown, we, we, we moved to this uh, online mode and it became almost a regular uh, weekly uh, event. So good morning, everyone. And sorry that we are not able to provide you with uh, breakfast, but I can see some of the panelists have their own coffee. So I'm not too worried. <laughs> I'm not too worried about that. So this morning, we are very fortunate uh, to have with us Prof Professor Andrea Cosarizza from the University of, of Modena and, and Reggio Emilia. And he's one of the world authorities in immune response <clears throat> to, to COVID-19. Uh, COVID and uh, with us is also Dr. Pier Guido Sarti of the Italian Embassy in, in Pretoria, who kindly uh, arranged for Professor Cosarizza to be with us uh, this morning. And in a second, I will ask Pier Guido to, to introduce Professor Cosarizza. <clears throat> On the panel are also Dr. Richard Lessels and Professor Tullio de Oliveira, who will moderate uh, your questions after the talk of Professor Cosarizza. And um, for those of you that uh, are new to Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, there is, a, there is a bar, and one of the items on the bar is a Q&A, and you're most than welcome to use that facility to, 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 to write your, uh, your questions. Yeah? <clears throat> on the panel, you also see Dr. Ilya Sinaiski, who also kindly agreed to be the backup plan in case my connection to Zoom fails miserably. <clears throat> So, uh, Pier Guido, may I ask you to kindly introduce Professor Cosarizza, please? Thank you very much. Good morning. It is a real pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Andrea Cosarizza. This seminar is part of a series organized as an initiative of Professor Francesco Petruccione. I take this opportunity to thank him for asking the Embassy of Italy in South Africa to facilitate this talk today. I have the privilege to say a few words on Professor Cossarizza this morning, a task which has required some effort on my side because it's, it is not possible to present his exceptional professional record in just a few words. His research field is immunology with a specific emphasis on the development and use of new flow cytometric approaches in immunological research. He has been working in the identification of the molecular and cellular basis and the involvement of the immune system in several diseases and infections. His current scientific interests are the characterization of the immune response and the, and the search for predictive markers in patients treated with biological drugs. Immune alteration, alterations during different human diseases in particular, HIV infection and autoimmune disorders. Immunological changes during aging and longevity in physiopathological conditions. In the last decade, he has built expertise in the clinical application of new methods for the identification of rare cellular subsets to patients affected by HIV infection and to patients undergoing liver transplantation as well as in patients suffering of multiple, multiple sclerosis or patients during septic shock. Such methods are conducive to a new and fine characterization of the functional activities of, of these cells and are now deeply utilized for deciphering immune changes in COVID-19. He's a board member of several international scientific organizations 
editorial board member of the journal AIDS and the journal Cytometry and has served as a reviewer for a list of journals which is too long to mention. Andrea Kossarica is currently full professor of general pathology and immunology, director of the School of Specialization in Clinical Pathology and Clinical Biochemistry, and vice president of the School of Medicine at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. He's also the president of the International Society for Advancement of Cytometry. His scientific production is impressive. As uh, of today, he has published three th 337 full papers on, uh, again, a long list of peer-reviewed international journals, which include science and nature protocols. His total impact factor is higher than 1,500, and uh, his H uh, index is 80. His papers have received more than uh, 33,600 citations. His professional engagement does not limit to research and publishing, as he is a very passionate teacher who has inspired a few generations of students. And Andrea, I am using a few because you are still relatively young. He is also very active on social media in a never-ending battle against fake news, scientific illiteracy, conspiracy theories, and myths of different origin. And trust me, being his friend on Facebook, I have the opportunity to appreciate his commitment in this battle. This also reflects in his activity as vice president of a transversal pact for science, a group of intellectuals whose aim is to promote the use of science as a universal value of humanity that cannot be denied or distorted for political or electoral purposes. After this short introduction, I will keep quiet and will eagerly listen to what Professor Kosarica will tell us uh, this, in this hour on the immune response of human body to the new coronavirus. Thank you, Per Guido. And uh, Professor Kosarica, please, you're welcome to share your screen and, 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 and start your presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Francesco, and thank you, Pier Guido. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you in South Africa, which is a country that I really love a lot. I came to Durban many years ago for the AIDS conference, and I, I've been very recently, a couple of years ago, all around uh, uh, the area of Stellenbosch, uh, Cape Town, and so on. So it's really a country that I love, and it's a really fantastic place. So what I will try to, to well, thank you Guido also for the kind words and the presentation. It's really, you mentioned too much and I have the impression that I've been working too much in my life. So um, the, uh, what I will present you is the result of the last four crazy months of our life in which um, we really spent all the day and night uh, in the lab uh, trying to understand what is happening with this horrible pandemic and with the, this virus that really has changed completely our life in all senses. What I will uh, try to, to show you is how the immune response works uh, and which are the damages that the immune response causes to the uh, body and the problems that uh, come out when the response to the virus is uh, a little bit exaggerated and uh, without any, any meaning. So my talk if i can move the slides okay uh, are of course uh, there will be a, a, an introduction then uh, i will tell you what we know and what we do not know i will tell you how to detect uh, t cells that are part of the immunity a big part of the immune system what is the cytokine storm and how you can study the production of different cytokines I have some news about B lymphocytes, and there is a paper that has been accepted just two days ago. And finally, I will try to conclude my talk uh, uh, showing other aspects. Uh, the story started at the end of uh, February when we saw the first patients, and immediately we had some questions that I posed in, in a paper that came out uh, very early in March, uh, in March 19, in cytometry. And the questions were why some patients experience a severe disease while others have a very mild or asymptomatic form of the infection. Why young children and why, why uh, pregnant women 
do not have a severe disease, at least in the 99% of cases, which is the role of the immune system in the pathogenesis of the infection. Do we have an immunological marker predictive of a severe disease or of a poor outcome? And do we have markers associated with the response of treatment? Uh, please note that in the beginning of March, uh, there was no treatment. I mean, people had no idea what to do. And I remember perfectly the, the meetings, the calls, and the phone, and the visits in the ICU, speaking with people and friends uh, who worked there, of course, and they, they were desperate because there, were, there was no treatment for these patients, and they were just going in ICU, get the intubation, and usually they died. So it was really heavy. But we knew uh, mm -hmm. that there were some information about coronaviruses, and uh, we knew from other infections that uh, something was going on in the immune system. Uh, for example, studies on the SARS-CoV, I will say one, the, the virus that affected the human beings in 2003 in China and Vietnam, and the, I remember the, the epidemics were stopped by a, an Italian doctor, Carlo Urbani, who was the first to recognize the pneumonia and he lost uh, his life because of this, but he was able to alarm the world of the new virus that was st uh, still there and fortunately did not circulate in the rest of the world. So we knew from uh, th these informations that uh, uh, SARS causes an impaired circulation of NK cells, T cells. There was a high frequency of CD8 cells. There was a high activation of all T cells, CD4 and CD8. There was a strong T cell memory correlated to the presence of neutralizing antibodies. And there were cells for different uh, proteins of the virus. And this is a, a kind of good news because uh, if you have cells uh, that uh, remain in the body for years, uh, it means that you can try to develop a vaccine which can be effective. Then we had information from the MERS. MERS is a Middle East uh, respiratory severe infection uh, which uh, affects uh, usually camels and dromedary camels in Saudi Arabia and is very limited in that part of the world. And I re just recall you that the epidemic is not finished because MERS uh, still exists there and there are some cases from time to time. And also in that case, we had uh, immune alterations that were easy to detect uh, and more or less uh, their uh, alterations were the same. I mean, the immune system was responding in the same way to these kind of coronaviruses. And the first information that we had uh, on SARS-CoV-2 came from China in early February. And uh, we knew that there was a decrease in total amount of lymphocytes, there was a lymphopenia, there was a reduction of several kind of cells. And I will show you in a moment what, uh, what we have found. About the humoral, cell resp the humoral response uh, antibodies, we knew that uh, there were problems with the production of antibodies and there some people could develop uh, IgG and uh, some people could develop uh, antibodies that were neutralizing and could recognize different epitopes on the protein of the virus. In MERS, uh, we have seen similar uh, results, uh, and, and, but we also saw that uh, uh, there was a delayed or weak antibody response which was associated with severe outcomes. So it means that if you do not respond well to, um, with the antibody production, the disease is more severe than in the other cases. There are many possible mechanisms of uh, immune evasion of, from, of the virus, and we knew that some factors could in some way influence the evasion of the uh, virus, which is not necessarily a good uh, or a bad uh, thing, because as I mentioned, several damages are provoked by the immune system. So it may well be that uh, a good immune response protect from the virus, which is logical because this is an infection, a too good, a too strong, I would say, immune response causes a lot of damages. And several factors are involved in this kind of 
problem, we, we, you have the apl haplotype of the host, the, the genetics of the host, but there are no data at the moment. The viral load, I mean the amount of production, the amount of the viral charge that you get in your body when you meet the virus can be important. We know that people with impaired immunity, like old individuals, can have a lot of troubles. And in fact, age is a main risk factor for the uh, mortality of the virus. The virus can cause a lot of problems, can inhibit the production of type 1 interferon, can alter the immune response, and can also inhibit uh, early innate immune response, which is a, a something very, very new to, to study, I mean, a new area, new field. So the immune impairment, uh, the invasion of the, of the, um, of the SARS to the immune, from the immune system and, and high viral load can cause uh, the, a lot of damages the first is the hyperactivation of the innate immune system, monocyte, macrophages, epithelial, and endothelial cells. I just remind you that endothelial cells are a lot. In the body, we, had, we have an enormous amount of endothelial cells. It's like uh, if you could put all the endothelial cells on the, on the ground, you would cover a football field, which is something very impressive in, from one single individual, I mean. Then the hyperactivation causes the overproduction of cytokine, chemokines, hyperinflammation, alteration of homing of the cells, and many cells like monocytes and neutrophils can move and go to the lung and other tissues can become activated, release product in the lung and cause a number of problems which end in the uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation in the uh, cytokine release syndrome and essentially in the interstitial pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome. What we have to study, we have to do a lot of things. At the beginning of the epidemics, we needed information on the innate immune response. We didn't, did not know which and how the innate immune system can control the early phase of the infection. We have no idea of what was the pathological or protective role of cytokines, chemokines, and other receptors, we had to understand better the immune response, the human immune response, the T cell immune response, which is the role of T cell activation and exhaustion, and the importance of Treg and the importance of the exposure to previous coronaviruses, because it is coming out now that uh, if you have been exposed to other coronaviruses in the, in the last years, uh, you develop a different immune response to the SARS-CoV-2 in comparison with what you have if you had not been exposed to other coronaviruses. The uh, study about immune phenotype came out from China. I mean, I've been working a lot of changes of immune cells in the blood, so uh, one of my field of interest is to understand the changes that lymphocyte uh, undergo when they, you study them in blood, which is blood, of, of course, is the most uh, simple uh, tissue that you can have from any sort of patient. So the, uh, what we knew from China is that uh, there was an increase in absolute number of lymphocytes, uh, there were changes in T cell counts with one CD8. Uh, then um, we also knew that uh, they adopted a sort of uh, guidelines for the treatment uh, of, uh, to, I mean, to monitor the infection and in particular the guidelines that they developed uh, were really um, on uh, the uh, counting of, of uh, T cells and in fact uh, what they suggest uh, in a recent uh, publication is the uh, use of the C4 and CD8 T cell count uh, for monitoring the infection. So in other words uh, uh, the, the early studies, this was published in uh, the early days, in the early days of February, uh, we had the first case in Italy at the end of February. So we, uh, we knew that uh, lymphocytes were uh, severely impaired in the uh, infection and you can monitor these cells. So for this reason, in my lab, we immediately set up all the facilities to receive uh, blood and from the very first case that we had in my home in my city, we could monitor the situation and study immediately what was happening in the immune system. And these are the, uh, the, the experience that we have and our data. So we saw the first patient in Modena in February 26th. 
And then we studied a first group of patients. Uh, there were 21 patients who were admitted in, the, in our clinics uh, in their early days of March. Then we finished a study, we sent out the paper, and we were asked to study more patients and to do more things in order to have the paper, uh, I mean, more complete, so we could enroll other patients. And they have typical symptoms of pneumonia, like uh, sore throat, fever, cold, dyspnea, chest pain, and so on. SARS-CoV-2 was present in all of them, and pneumonia was confirmed by its rays. The first thing that we saw was the lymphocyte count that was very low. The range was between 360 and less than 2,000, while with a median value of 1,000 cells per microliter, while the normal value of our lab is about 2,750, so one half of the normal value. Then we perform a first, T cell characterization with the use of flow cytometry. For those who are not familiar with flow cytometry, this is a, te a technology that allows you to uh, detect uh, an antigen or any other molecule at the single cell level. You stain a cell with different antibodies. Each antibody can have a different fluorochrome, I would say a different color. So you can recognize the presence of the antigen simply detecting the fluorescence that comes from the antibody. So in other words, you have an antibody with a molecule which is colored, you put the cells under a machine, which is a little bit complicated, but essentially like a big microscope, and you can recognize cells that are positive or negative to one parameter or to another. So it means that if you stain cells for a marker that for a, with an antibody, recognizes CD4 and you have a red fluorescent molecule, all CD4 cells become red, while CD8 do not, are not stained. So you can see how many red cells you have and how many non-red cells you have, and you can count the percentage of CD4. You do that on a microscope. This was done many, many years ago, 40 years ago at least. And then if you work with a microscope, for obvious reasons, after a couple of samples, your eyes are gone. But if you do this with a flow cytometer, which is a, an instrument working with lasers, filters, photomultipliers, and so on, you can analyze up to 50,000 cells per second. And you can analyze in this very moment up to 30 or even more parameters per cell. So it means that you have a huge amount of information that you can obtain from a single little uh, amount of blood. So this was the stain that we have done. Uh, we have developed a panel with 19 parameters. And what we could do was to, first of all, we detect the number of, uh, of uh, cells uh, in, in our blood, in, in the blood of patients. And this is the, the, one of the papers that we published. This came out in Nature Communication a couple of, few, couple of weeks ago. And uh, what we found was that uh, well, the percentage of CD4 cells was not so different between controls and patients with pneumonia, but the number, the absolute number was absolutely uh, decreased. And in fact, if you see how many, the, the difference between the number of CD4 cells in the blood between control and patients. Then what we did was to uh, analyze uh, in details the quality of CD4 cells you know that in the immune system you have population, subpopulation, and sub sub subpopulations. So you can study a, a huge amount of different cell types and understand what they do. For example, if you activate the immune system, you have some markers that come out in CD4, some other markers that come out in CD8. So it means that um, you can recognize the quality of the response, the quality of the immune system, and how the immune system responds to any antigen or to any other molecule. So with this little, uh, some tricks, I mean, this is what you have from flow cytometry, each dot represents one cell, so you can analyze millions of cells in a sample, you can recognize T cells, then you can recognize CD4 and CD8 cells. And among these populations, you can recognize the, uh, for example, those that are activated, 
though uh, the, that um, are senescent or exhausted, differentiation of the cells with naive central memory, effectual memory, or terminal dependency cells, you can recognize the rates, and then in the same samples, you can also study other parameters, like, for example, the amount of naive cells that uh, contain a little amount of what we call T stem cell memory, which are memory cells that re recall what has happened before and are the memory cells that are needed in order to develop an efficient immune response. Then among Treg uh, regulatory T cells, you can recognize other subpopulations and have a very clear idea or idea of what is happening in the immune response. What about different T cell population, the CD4? So what we found was that, uh, again, the percentages of some populations were not so different in between controls and patients. I, I mentioned naive cells or central memory cells or even effector memory cells, but the number was very different. So there was an impairment, a decrease, a total decrease in lymphocytes, which likely accounts for the inability of patients to develop a decent immune response against the virus. Then we have analyzed other markers like the activation of cells and what came out is surprising, quite surprising that most patients had markers of activation like HLA-DR or CD38. I mean, this means that there is an increased activation of CD4 cells, but they also had markers of exhaustion Exhaustion means that when the immune system is tired and has done its job, it uh, in a way falls down and is not able to respond anymore. So in the same blood, in the same sample, we have activation and exhaustion, which is really uh, impressive from the immunological point of view. Then what we perform was a more complex analysis and we can detect uh, all the markers together with the use of some bioinformatics approach. So we can use uh, systems like a little bit complicated to explain to, uh, to identify in the same sample, naive cells, central memory cells, effector memory cells, uh, stem cell memory and so on, and uh, identify different populations in one single uh, bag, in, a, in one single shot, I mean. So what came out is that, uh, again, this, uh, the, the importance of this uh, analysis is that uh, it is completely unsupervised. I mean, you cannot intervene in the data. It means that uh, something new is a new frontier of uh, cytometry. And the new frontier is that uh, this, uh, there is an intelligent uh, machine learning system uh, according to which uh, what you do is automatically analyzed by the instruments that you have in front of you or from the computer. So it means that uh, you cannot in any manner intervene in the analysis and this is a very nice unbiased method to present, to study and to have results. Well, what, what came out from these un unsupervised methodologies is that uh, we found important changes again in naive cells, in effective memory, in central memory, and in uh, activation cells that were very much activated. And these data confirmed what we have seen with the supervised methodology, with the manual gating, I mean with the manual analysis of data. Uh, and so we were quite happy because uh, again the results were absolutely compatible and one similar to the other, again identical to the other. And this is a paper that Sarah the bias in my group publishing in last week in Nature Communication. Then we uh, were asked to go more into details and to see which are the, uh, if uh, lymphocytes from these patients had alterations in what we call master regulator genes or chemokine receptors. And what came out is that uh, indeed, uh, we could uh, develop, we develop another uh, panel of antibodies, another panel of um, analysis with the different markers that recognize the differentiation of T cells among uh, towards, I mean, Th1, Th2, Th17, and uh, I mean, the main population of C4. And what came out is that in some cases we had a decrease in markers of uh, homing. And in other, we have an increase in other markers. So it means that, uh, to make a long story short, uh, what we found among CD4 cells is that uh, 
uh, the differentiation towards uh, TH1, TH2, and TH17 was not dramatically different, but uh, there were markers of homing uh, in CD4 and especially in CD8, as I will show you in a moment, that are completely different among patients and control. And recall what happens in other pathologies and in also in animal models, in which uh, when you provoke an infection to lung, for example, to the lungs, uh, you have a homing of some populations of cells that completely disappear from the blood, like in the case of cells that are 606 positive or 3161 positive. So, I mean, these populations are those that are able to go to the lung, induce inflammation, and increase the damages that you have in the organ. And again, other markers have been studied with and this cell population here, the cells that are double positive for CCRC, which is a homing receptor, a chemokine receptor, and CD161 are those that go to the lung and in the model of, in the semia model of a viral infection, provoke damages there and activate neutrophils. Then the other question was, but how do they sell these cells work? Are they able to proliferate? Are they able to divide? Are they effect, uh, efficient? And in principle, I would say, yes, so the cells are working quite well. There are little changes in the proliferation of some populations like the effector cells, but the changes were not so heavy. And actually the proliferation index was a little bit different, but uh, the, in this population, the percentages of cells uh, that divided were was higher. So there were more cells able to divide, but uh, the number of cell cycles were, was lower. So uh, more cells were doing something in a wrong way. This is my, the message. Then since my lab has been working on mitochondria for many years, we were interested in the bioenergetic analysis of these cells and we could use a system according to which we can measure many parameters in these organelles in living cells with a, an instrument which is called Seahorse that allows you to measure in, um, in, a, in an experiment, uh, the basal respiration of the cell, the pro proton leak, the ATP production, and the maximum respiration in terms of oxygen consumption. So you know that cells uh, need uh, energy, and the cell to produce energy, cells need to produce ATP and to use oxygen. So in this, with this methodology, we were able to, uh, to see whether the uh, production of ATP and the respiration of cells were normal or not. So what came out, again, to make a long story short, was that CD4 cells were working perfectly. So they had actually no problems of respiration, and it means that the specific immune response is uh, eff efficient and can in some way act as uh, it can. I mean, uh, there are cells work well, Probably in some cases they work too well, and I will show you eventually uh, at the end of the of the talk if we have time what happens in other cell types like monocytes and granulocytes that behave in in a completely different manner. So again, uh, this is the, the result of uh, the activation of cells from a patient and from COVID patient of a control non-stimulating cells in red or stimulating cells. You see that there, are, there is an increase in uh, some parameters, like for in this case, the extracellular acidification. So it means that uh, the, uh, the production of uh, um, energy is uh, well preserved in both in patients and in controls, as you can see on the right. Then we have been studying another cell population, which is CD8 cells. The approach was the same as before. So we have uh, a normal percentage of CD8 cells, but a decreased number of these uh, elements in the blood. Again, taking a look to the differentiation, activation, summation, and so, on and so on, what we found was that in the CD8 compartment was more affected than CD4. So, uh, and this is quite logical because the uh, antiviral response is usually uh, a business of CD8 cells more than CD4. I mean, a direct business of these cells that have to control infected cells and eventually to kill infected cells. So uh, naive CD8 cells were decreased as well as central memory, both in the terms of percentage in the blood or the absolute number 
per microliter. And it was my interest for us because it means that you are depleting central memory cells that are those who apparently have to keep the memory to a given pathogen. Then uh, again, what we saw was a, a phenomenon very similar to what we have described for CD4 cells. I mean, in the number of, a high number of activated cells and an increased number of cells that were exhausted. So also in this case, we have activation and exhaustion. Then we perform the unsupervised classification of the cells with the same methodology that I showed you before, with a new map uh, system which allowed to identify all cell populations in one single, in one single shot. And again, in one single graphic, we perform the unsupervised analysis of the cells. And also in this case, we found the simultaneous presence of markers of exhaustion and markers of activation in the cells. So you have a part of the immune system that works well and a part of the immune system which is completely exhausted and in the same tube in the same patient. The analysis of mass and regulation of genes and chemokine receptor was performed in the same way as I showed you before with the homing um, markers of cell homing mark and chemokine receptors. And also in this case, uh, we have some surprises. In particular, the, the most important result was the presence here of a high amount of cells that were positive for CD161 and CCR6. Over here, you can see this population over there, which is a high amount of both markers. And that's important because this population, again, is the population who um, moves the homing of uh, cytotoxic cells to the to organs like the lung. And you can see here that also in the case of CD8 cells, a high amount of cell, um, a number of cells were able to uh, express these markers and uh, these markers, again, are those that move cells to the lung. Cell proliferation was similar to what we found in CD4, and also CD8 had some troubles, especially in the terminal differential cells in the TE population over here, and there were changes in cell proliferation also among these cells. Then the other question was what happens to the cytokine? We know that there is an important cytokine storm and cytokine production. So what we performed was, first of all, a study to understand what we can do and how we can use the blood of patients. So we, we published a paper in April showing the handling and processing of a blood specimen for detection of the cytokine storm. And to make a most very short, uh, we studied a number of patients and controls. And what we found was an impressive amount of some cytokines in the periphery, in the plasma, of patients. And what was very strange to my eyes and was to see that uh, there is a big confusion in the, in the cytokine production because we had markers of um, uh, inflammation like IL-6, which is the main cytokine maybe in, in the story, or interleukin-8, which is a molecule able to activate neutrophil. So it means that you have a, a great inflammation, a great uh, inflammatory status, but you have also IL-10 and IL-4 that are anti-inflammatory molecules. So in a plasma of patients, you can see molecules that do completely different things, inflammation or anti-inflammation. And this is made a complete panel of cytokine that we have uh, studied, and you can see that uh, in several cases, the red dots the, um, that are related to uh, patients, to COVID patients, are much higher than the blue dots that are controls. Again, you have a number of molecules that move and that uh, are increased in, in, in patients, including TNF-alpha, interleukin one interleukin beta IL-7, and so on. So a number of molecules go up. And you can find interest in correlation among different cytokines or chemokines. In this case, we found correlation between molecules which are inflammatory molecules, that make sense, and molecules which are anti-inflammatory, like IL-4 and IL-13. So these are papers study that we're still to do. One nice uh, result, uh, very useful from a clinical point of view, was to understand that uh, blocking a molecule like interleukin-6 uh, with an uh, antibody which is called tocilizumab 
and is a molecule a, a antibody able to block the receptor for interleukin 6 uh, treating people with this drug with tocilizumab caused a dramatic reduction in the probability of mechanical ventilation or, or, or death and a dramatic reduction in the, the, in the death of patients. So it means that uh, using this drug that we start to do this in the early period of, of March, immediately when we, we had the first data, we could save a number of lives because the mortality dropped of 80 percent which is something really unbelievable for to our eyes in that period and then the paper was published a couple of weeks ago in the lancet rheumatology it is not yet in pubmed i have no idea why but if you go to the to the home web page of the lancet rheumatology the paper is there so you can see what we have done in terms of use of biological drugs to block uh, and the activity of the immune system, I mean, pneumonia patients. We have, done, we have then performed a other amount of studies studying for detecting the production of cytokines in vitro to see how cells were working. And we have set up a classical methodology to study cytokine production. And we could detect the amount of cytokines are present in, uh, among, inside, I mean, C4, or CD8 cells, we could study Gramzyme, EIL17, interferon gamma, IL2, TNF alpha, and many other parameter, parameters. And what came out in CD4 or in CD8 is that also in vitro cells from patients were able to produce high amounts of cytokines. So there is a, a sort of um, imprint of, of um, uh, in the immune system in these patients according to which they produce a huge amount of stuff not only and you can detect the production of such amount of molecules of all types in the blood as well as in a very clean system like in vitro simulation in vitro you have only lymphocytes very clean 100 percent pure and you can see that also in that case after some stimuli cells produce molecules like inflammatory cytokines, including interleukin-17, which is a very potent mediator of inflammation. And this happens both in CD4 and in CD8 cells. So there is a skewing of cells towards TH17 or TC17 for those of you who are working in the immunology field. And what came out, came out is also a, a nice change in the polyfunctionality of cells, uh, polyfunctionality means the capacity of one single cell to produce different molecules in the same time. And again, to make an also short, uh, what we could see is that there were changes in the cell polyfunctionality, and even study functionality came out came out that IL-17 positive cells were very important in this phenomenon. I have some last, very last slides about B lymphocytes. The paper is new, just came out, uh, was accepted two days ago. And we have studied different B cell populations. Of course, uh, you, you know that B cells are the precursor of plasma cells, and plasma cells are the cells that have produced antibodies that block the infection. B cells do produce antibodies, but usually they have low affinity and low ability for the antigen. So they are antibody, antibodies that work so and so, I would say. And you can study different population of B cells, and this is the manual gated that we have performed to identify this population, and we found memory B cells, memory switched, memory unswitched. We, have, we can detect the plasma blasts. So plasma blasts are, more, are cells that usually should stay in a bone marrow because they are not mature. But what we found was that there was a high amount of plasma blasts. And here you see the, and by the way, the different population of B cells, this is the total number of B cells. And also in this case, there is a decrease in the B cell, uh, in the number of B cells. Different population, the analysis of different population revealed that uh, in some cases, the percentages were similar, but the total number was lower. And if you take a look to the memory B cells, if either switched or unswitched, more mature or less mature, you see that there is a dramatic decrease in the amount of B cell or memory B cells. On the contrary, we found a, a consistent increase in plasma blasts. And these cells are, again, 
not uh, they don't have to stay in blood they should stay in the, in the bone marrow and they have to mature and become plasma cells so the presence of uh, this uh, population means that the bone marrow is forced to release cells and to do something that usually it do, does not have to do uh, we have repeat the analysis with the unsupervised methodology that um, we are now quite expert in this and what we found again was a dramatic change and you can see in the blue the, sorry the green column here indicates that the uh, the p value of uh, the difference related to the difference between patients and control and you see that almost all cell populations are green so it means that uh, a dramatic change in b cell compartment of course and honestly this is not completely unexpected simply because uh, B cells are very sensitive to IL-6 and interleukin-6 is produced in industrial amounts uh, during the COVID infection. So the IL-6 provokes a dramatic change in not only in the T cell compartment but also in the B cell compartment and these data are probably the first uh, who analyze in, <clears throat> in details the changes in the B cell compartment. How do they work? B, cell, B cells work perfectly. We, we found no changes in any parameters related to B cell proliferation in terms of uh, relative number of cells that are able to proliferate and in terms of number of cell cycles per single cell. And you see here that we found no difference between controls and patients. But what we found in a different uh, uh, type of analysis is something very uh, peculiar so we could uh, um, divide the population of patients in two groups, uh, those who died and those who were discharged. And with the use of the principal component analysis, which is a methodology that we use for many years uh, to identify patterns, what we found is that if you, this is the area of the PCA uh, graph in which uh, patients who are discharged is, are present, and this is the area of patients who died and as you can see here the there are parameters related to b cells like memory switch memory igm only transitional cells memory switch b cell total b cell or naive that are very important in this in uh, uh, determining the survival of pay of patients while uh, parameters like uh, a high amount of c-reactive protein d-dimer uh, ck um, oxygen imam of oxygen and so on creatinine and so far score these are very important in determining the death of patients along with the total amount of igm the igm are the first immunoglobulins that are produced in a, in a in immune response and it is very likely that if you have a strong release of these molecules of igm in the early phases of the infection you are more on the side of uh, people who are going to die in comparison with those who survive. So these are the markers, these are the parameters that are important in determining the two uh, clinical results. And in fact, this is what we, we, we can summarize. Uh, in you, you have a death or discharge of the patient. Uh, in the death of the patient, these are the parameters that are important. Pro in, Radioactive protein, the dimer, plasma, IgM level, so on, and, and lactic dehydrogenase. While the parameters are important in the discharge of patients, are the presence of a good number of naive memory cells, lymphocyte count, platelets, and the respiratory parameters. And probably there is a window of opportunity in which you can intervene with drugs like anti interleukin receptor or tocilizumab that we have used, and probably this drug can alter the equilibrium of plasma blasts and neutrophils and bring them to the good side of the, uh, of the moon, I would say. Conclusion, as I show you, the virus causes a very confused immune response in which you, we had in the same moment markers and T cells that are exhausted, activated, or senescent, we have seen an alter differentiation of different T-cell types. We have found a high amount of level, a high plasma level of a variety of cytokines, inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, which is a very uh, complex uh, situation. We have seen also dramatic differences in several populations of B cells. 
So in my opinion, COVID-19 looks like a catastrophic sepsis with concomitant aspects of activation, inhibition, and so on. We have found that there is a molecule which is produced in high amounts in vitro, which is interleukin 17, which is important in the recruitment and activation of neutrophils, cells that migrate to the lung and are heavily involved in the pathogenesis of COVID-19. And we have suggested that we can try to block the pathway of IL-17 with biological drugs that are already available and could be an additional new strategy to improve the health of patients with the infection by the virus. Let me acknowledge a number of people. I have to acknowledge those who made big donations to us in the very beginning of the epidemics. In the early days, we have the Glam Gas, which is a company in Modena. They do produce um, kitchens they, they, and gas uh, stuff to, to, to cook, I mean. And they gave us a big amount of money immediately, as well as uh, San Felice Banca Popolare, the B Banca Popolare in Romagna, and uh, other groups of people who uh, really donated some money for, to our experiments. And we have a, a, an account in the bank. We receive a lot of small but very important donation. People are giving us 10, 20 euros, just to tell you the, the amount. This is a group of people who have been working, who is working actually with, with us. We have a very big group of uh, friends and colleagues in the infectious disease clinics in the Department of, of Anesthesia and Intensive Care, in the Respiratory Disease Unit, and so on. And these are all the people we have been working uh, with, and especially with a group of uh, infectious disease clinics, which is directed by Cristina Mossini, who is my wife, by the way. So we have to, we work together in the hospital and at home and everywhere, so which is quite stressful. And finally, uh, this is the uh, these are the eyes of people in my group uh, working like crazy for months. You see here Sara, Lara, uh, Rebecca, Caterina, Alicia, Lucia, Domenico, Marco, and Anna Maria. And of course, I want to thank you for your attention. Yeah, Professor Kosarica, thank you so much for, for this very interesting talk and for sharing your, 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 your huge wisdom in the immune response at, on, on cellular level and for describing this very thrilling story of the, of the quite confused uh, response of our immune system to the attack of this virus. <clears throat> May I kindly ask Richard and Tullio to, to share questions of the audience of, of, or of yourself with, um, with Professor Kosarica, please. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Thank you so much. A really impressive uh, body of work that you've managed to do in a short space of time during a, during a really overwhelming uh, epidemic in Italy. Uh, very impressive. Just while I think people are just starting to put some questions in now, but maybe while we start to collate those, can I just ask, uh, were you surprised that uh, of the finding uh, from the UK recovery trial that, that uh, dexamethasone had such a, a marked effect on mortality? So, so we, we look at all this detail of the immune response and, and, and we want to target specific uh, parts of the immune response and yet the only drug that's shown mortality benefit in, in randomized trials is this kind of very broad uh, agent across the immune system. Did, did that surprise you or, or not? No, not at all. Not at all, because as I show you, the activation of the immune system is probably the main cause of the damages. I mean, there is a, 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 a the first phase of the infection can provoke nothing in most patients, in most people. But in other people, so for reasons that we do not know, the infection goes uh, ahead. And what happens is that, uh, in my opinion, my impression is that you have a very potent uh, innate immune response uh, immediately, and you produce a huge amount of cytokines, as I show you, among which IL-6, uh, IL-1, IL-2, and whatever. And these cytokines activate massively the immune response, uh, and cells uh, do what they want. So there is no rule. Uh, I mean, you see, as I show you, my, my, I was shocked to see 
a huge amount of inflammatory molecules and anti-inflammatory molecules. Makes no sense. We have now repeated the experiment, the, the data on more than 300 people, and we are analyzing the data in these days. But the impression is the same. I mean, uh, it's like an orange, you know? You take an orange, you squeeze, everything comes out. And this is an immune system. The example that I, I make uh, every time I have, uh, I speak with people, is that it is like in the Olympic Games. Uh, in the Olympic Games, if you, if you are a, a big guy in, the, in 100 meters, uh, you have a competition, you run 100 meters, you arrive at the end, you are completely destroyed because you gave all you can do, and someone comes to you and tells you, hey, guy, sorry, you made a mistake. You are not supposed to run the 100 meters. You have to run a marathon. So please go. But you cannot do that because you are already destroyed. You, are, you, are, you have done all you can do, and uh, there is no strength anymore. And this is what happens in the immune response. So if you block this uh, uh, phase uh, with molecules like the cortisone or whatever, or the somethosone, and you really uh, calm down the, in the immune response. But what is important, again, is that in our trial, tocilizumab was dramatically effective. And actually, I tell you one story. We have not done a randomized trial for one reason, ethics. We saw the results in the first three patients. In patient number three, in which we used tocilizumab, we gained tocilizumab at, uh, let's say, 8 o'clock in, in the evening, then other, another dose at 8 o'clock in the morning, and in a few hours, this patient was not breathing, in no way, I mean, it was really in horrible conditions, wake up and start to go around the room. And he was in excellent shape. So after three cases like this, uh, the idea was to use it to everybody, full stop, and to perform a study, which is a, a controlled a retrospective study, because at that time, we already had a huge number of patients who could not benefit from the drug. So the comparison was between those who took tocilizumab and those who took nothing simply because tocilizumab was not available. And for this reason, we think that it is not ethic not to treat patients who could really benefit from the drug. And we refused to do a randomized trial. And by the way, the paper was sent to the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was uh, uh, there for couple of weeks uh, with no comment, no reaction, and then it came out, it came back to, to us uh, with no comments, uh, simply because it was not randomized. And in the same moment, uh, I am not, uh, <laughs> I don't want to criticize anybody, but in the same moment, a unuseful randomized trial on hydroxychloroquine came out, uh, which was absolutely devoid of any sense. And then we sent a paper to the Lancet and we published there, the, the rheumatology section of the journal. But again, the, what is clear is that if you block the immune response in a very precise way, in a very precise manner, you can really save thousands of lives. That's the, 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 my, my, my point. Great, thank you. One of the questions coming through from a few panelists is, is about um, what our understanding of the immune response means for the risk of reinfection and what this tells us about um, how effective vaccines might be and if I just explained that we're kind of just at the stage this week where where there's a, a lot of noise about reinfections so we've started to see some cases which are probably just persistent or recurrent PCR positivity, but are being yeah. labeled as, as, as reinfections a, a little bit irresponsibly. Um, and so there's a lot of excitement, a lot of worry about this at the moment in South Africa. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the excitement and worries are everywhere in this moment, I guess. The, 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 this is a very good question. I, one billion dollar question. The, the point is, uh, <clears throat> we have no idea of what can happen after the reinfection. In, in the case of a reinfection, for one simple reason, because the virus arrived a few months ago. So we have no idea what can happen in the next month. I don't have the crystal ball, I always say. I, I, have no, I, I cannot predict the, uh, 
uh, the, I cannot make predictions, especially if they regard the future. You say <laughs> it is difficult to say anything. Uh, we have a new virus. We have a new uh, the virus is a coronavirus that uh, infects either the high or the lower respiratory tract, and this is quite new in comparison with the other coronaviruses that we had uh, in the last years. And we we don't know how long how effective is the immune system and how long the immune system can continue can can, can be there. In <clears throat> the bad news is that. Uh, few people develop uh, neutralized antibodies. So apparently, if you don't have neutralized, in a viral infection, if you do not have neutralized antibodies, you cannot control the infection. That's the, the, the bad news. The good news is that there are tricks that you can use with vaccine strategies to have these antibodies production. And so it may well be that uh, the vaccination, I mean, in this moment, as far as I know, there are about 200 different uh, groups or companies <clears throat> trying to develop a vaccine. So I am sure that the one of the strategies has to work. No discussion. There were papers coming out uh, <coughs> last week uh, in, Lance, in the Lancet and the, in the New England showing the, uh, the fact that if you vac use uh, adenovirus uh, vectors or uh, mRNA uh, strategies, you can develop a good immune response in terms of antibodies and in terms of T cells. So it means that you can see the virus and you can react to the virus. And of course, we have studied a lot of uh, samples in which we have antibodies against the virus, both IgM or IgG. The problem is that uh, we do not know whether with the disinfection you activate uh, lymphocytes that have been exposed to previous coronaviruses. And this is a study made by Alessandro Sette in La Jolla, and it showed that uh, you can have a secondary response to this, uh, to this virus, and you have a secondary response simply because you had a primary response years ago. So he was able to study samples collected three, four, five years ago, and some samples were reacting to coronavirus peptides. So it means that there is a cross reaction between this virus and other coronavirus that we met in the past. And to me, the coronavirus is not so difficult. I mean, if you have a common cold, that's one could be one coronavirus. So the, we have to still to study a lot of things and to know, we don't know a lot of things about this virus. So we, we really have to, to understand what happens and the question if uh, there are changes of reinfection once the patient has fully recovered is really an important point. In this moment, we have not seen this up to now. So in, in our in our universe, in our hospital, we have not seen secondary cases. Probably we have seen people who keep the virus alive for months. We have seen people with the, the, the positive nasal swab for 65 days, which is a lot. But we don't know if the virus is real, the virus, or just pieces of the virus dead within epithelial cells. So that there are a lot of all things we, we have still to understand. And, and just one other thing we're, we're very interested in here in South Africa, and I know that you've, you've done a lot of work on, on HIV before. When we, when we saw this virus sweeping the world, one of our big worries was, was what the interaction with HIV would be and whether HIV would, would increase the risk of, of severe disease and mortality. But we haven't really seen that. There's some evidence from the Western Cape that it, that it increases the risk of mortality uh, from COVID, but, but it's not a profound effect. Um, does, does that surprise you with what you understand about the, the immune system and the response? Honestly, no. Honestly, no, because uh, if you have a, uh, if most damages are produced by the hyperactivation of the immune system, people who have a sort of immune suppression could, be, I paradoxically, benefit of this. So I, I'm trying to understand here what happens in, in other situations, like, for example, in pregnant women. Pregnant women, they 
apparently have little troubles with the, the, the SARS-CoV-2, very little troubles. And we know that the immune system is uh, skewed towards a TH2 situation. I mean, more, uh, I mean, a pregnant woman, ha a woman has to cope with a number of antigens that comes from the husband because the, the fetus is one, genetically speaking, one half of the earth and one half of the, of the father. So the, the immune system has to not to react too much and has to tolerate antigens that do not belong to the, to the mother. So there is a skewing towards TH2 that means uh, a sort of light immune suppression. I really think that people who have a light immune suppression like pregnant women, possibly or probably people who are taking biological drugs for um, autoimmune diseases, and probably also people with HIV infection, they should be in a in some way spared from a severe SARS CoV 2 infection. And in fact, uh, I do not recall HIV patients here with COVID, uh, with severe COVID pneumonia or patients who take under uh, who take uh, biological drugs but actually we have a study going on that that's that's reassuring to to yeah. you, any yes. any other questions if you're there what does it mean well the, the other question is how probably how how long that will it take to have a vaccine that's a good point I mean, the information that we have now are that there are vaccines can induce a good immune response, an effective immune response in terms of production of antibodies or production of T cells specific for the virus. The real question is how this, uh, how this long, I mean, how long the, this response will remain and how effective this is. And to know, to do, to know this, uh, uh, you have only to wait. You have only to wait for uh, to see how long the, the immune response uh, ends and how much, uh, how many cells you, you still keep after months and so on. But the, the problem is, is that we need time. We need time, but time, we do not have time, but we need it. I, I, I see a question about the tocilizumab. Um, and somebody's asking, um, why is it not being purported as a treatment option? Why is there not been randomized trials? I mean, there are some randomized trials of, of tocilizumab going on. So, so it is part of the, the large uh, recovery trial in, in the UK, and there will yes. be data coming out on that. Um, and it, is, it, is, it has been purported as a treatment option, and, and I think it has been used here in the, in the private sector in, in South Africa, uh, in some of the early patients. I, I'm not sure if it's still being used. So I, I, I think it has been used in many countries, hasn't it? Um, yeah, the, the, the point is that you have to use it correctly. I mean, if you use it at the very beginning, when you have very good respiratory parameters, it is completely unuseful because it, it doesn't work. If you use it too late in the ICU, it doesn't work because the cytokine storm has already done the job. So there is a window of opportunity in which you have to do that. And you have to follow patients to see when the PNF goes down, when the respiratory parameters are, are worsening. In that case, in that phase, it is fantastic, definitely. But and, and not the, late. And the, 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 there was a trial of another agent, is it Sarilim, Sarilimab? Or uh, that was, the trial was stopped early because it didn't seem to be having any effect. Sar Sarilimab, yeah. Does, does that have a different uh, mode of action? Or do you think there was problems that they were using that too early, too late, or? Probably uh, there was, this was one, one problem. The other problem is the dose. The dose is important. If you don't uh, have a decent amount of uh, drug, it cannot work. So it, it is a problem of timing and dose. The dose was low, too low. That's the point. And uh, to my knowledge, there are other trials in France 
in which they are using other biological drugs to block the, the cytokine storm. But up to now, as I told you, and I repeat uh, that we have not performed a randomized trial because it, was, it is not ethical. We prefer to save lives than to publish a paper in a new journal. Okay, and I just I see one good question just coming through um, about um, whether the research that you've done, whether it's identified or allows us to um, have any predictors of who might progress to severe disease. So a, a, a kind of important question for somewhere like here where the health system is getting overwhelmed and, and where um, being able to identify who's most at risk of developing severe disease um, when they present might help us to triage people more effectively within the, the health system. Well, is, is, where are we with that? Well, probably this is uh, mm, the full data have still to be analyzed because uh, what comes out uh, is that several cell populations are in involved and what we have seen with the B cells, uh, we could perform uh, the, this analysis, uh, putting on the balance uh, the number of B cells and a lot of other things. Uh, and what comes out is that probably the, uh, if you study plasma, the levels of interleukin-6 are important, uh, but also those of TNF and other inflammatory molecules. But the only problem is that the cost uh, is high, usually the cost of these uh, analysis. I mean, it is not the, the, the white or red blood uh, cell count. This is much, much more expensive. So the, um, the point is that if you could measure in the same moment some cytokines like IL-6, IL-1, and TNF, uh, and eventually IL-10, and identify plasma blasts and the activation of T cells, uh, probably you have a very good predictor marker for that. This is one, one of, the, of the impressions that we have. But uh, we, we, have, we have data, we have still to, to put all together. And uh, because we perform our study in the uh, very early uh, days of the pneumonia, and now we have the outcome in the long the distance. We have out, different clinical outcomes in terms of death, of course, and you, you see immediately, and in, in, uh, in terms of uh, alterations in lung functionality. So we have to compare all these parameters. But there is a lot of studies to, 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 to be done and to finish now. Okay, so lots, lots more work to be done. Oh, yes. So I, 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 think we've, I think we've run over time. There are a few other questions, okay. but I think we've covered uh, some of the most pressing questions. So I, I'll hand back to you. Francesco and just say thanks again Andrea. Thanks to you for being here with, with me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you Richard for, for moderating the questions and um, <clears throat> yes indeed we went a little bit uh, over time and uh, Professor Kosarica thank you so much for, for being with us this morning. You, you, you saw from the many questions that the, the great interest that uh, there is in this country for for your work and for the for for the pioneering work that, that you have done and for the for the way forward that you that you are indicating, really, thank you so much for for being with us this morning. <clears throat> also, a big thank you to Pier Guido Sarti of the Italian Embassy for for making this talk possible uh, this morning, and uh, of course to Richard and uh, and Tullio and Ilia for <clears throat> for assisting with all the technicalities of this. Uh, of this meeting this morning. Professor Kosarica, I wish you a, a lovely day and a lot of success with your, with your work in the, in, the near, in the near future. Thank you very much for being with us and we will definitely stay, stay in touch. And thank, thank, you, you, Francesco, Guido. thank you, Thank you, Francesco, thank you, Guido, and thanks to all the audience. And of course, if someone wants to write me in private, and my, my name is every, in Google and you find my address and everything. Thank you very much. And hopefully in the near future, you will be able to visit us in South Africa again. I hope so. I really love the country. It's a fantastic place. Okay. I've been... I, I, I've, yeah, been I, in, I, I've been in a shark cage four times. 
I know. Okay, it. okay. Yeah, nice. sure. That's good. Uh, Wonderful. So I hope we will the change was going to... strong. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <Okay. laughs> it's been strong. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much again. My pleasure. Have, have a good day, and um, and uh, and we will see you again here next week. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao, Francisco. Thank you so much. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Ciao.